Hi, everybody. Welcome to the episode of the Alad Pod. We'll get started in just a bit, and we're very excited for this episode today. While you are waiting, please go ahead and share the video, whatever platform you're on, so that we can get more folks in. If you would like to submit your questions, you'll be able to do that via Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or also text message, and we'll have all that information up for you. But while you're waiting, go ahead and share so we can get more folks in, and you can do that right now. My name is Alad Gross. I'm running for Attorney General of Missouri. This is Mr. Toby over here. Political consultants from out of state directing his office. And we paid for it. And this time we'll be donating it to a school in Kansas City. It is Ms. Mangus's classroom. Gross says he's doing all of this to enforce Missouri's sunshine law and get transparency and accountability to, quote, fix our democracy. If we have a healthier community, or our state rather, right. we will have a, a, a more viable workforce. Now this is an opportunity for us to look into our hearts and see who we want to be when we come out of it. What do we want to tell future generations about the great pandemic of 2020 and what we did and how we were there for each other? All right, everybody, welcome to the Alad Pod. We are very excited today to have our guest, Thomas Apt. We will be talking about violence, uh, strategies to reduce violence, um, and, and a lot of ways that those can apply right here to Missouri. This is a very important issue for so many of us in our state. Um, I've often talked about this, um, having taught kids for about 13 years now. Unfortunately, so many of our children are impacted by this 
directly and indirectly in so many ways. Um, so we're really excited to have him on. I know a lot of you were interested in asking questions and bringing those today. If you are on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, wherever you are, go ahead and comment and let us know you're there. Uh, you can put your questions right into the comments and we'll see those on here. And some of you know we can even put those directly on the screen so we can we can share everything that you all are thinking uh, and uh, make sure to get your questions answered. So uh, thank you all for coming. Make sure to share the video. Let people know that you're watching uh, so that we can get more folks in on this conversation. So let me bring in Thomas. Make sure he's there. Well, hello, sir. Can you still hear me? I can. How are you? Great. I'm great. Thanks so much for coming. I appreciate you making the uh, the, the virtual trip to Missouri. So uh, here we are in the socially distanced world. But uh, no, I really do appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, so Thomas is... Uh, he's a senior fellow at the the Council on Criminal Justice. Um, so I, I know that's it's a it's a very nice sounding title. Could you tell us what you do in that role? Um, what what your I guess you're obviously doing a lot of research on this topic, but what what's your main responsibilities in that role? Sure. Uh, at the council, uh, I've just transitioned to the council uh, a few months ago after spending five years at Harvard, uh, during which time I, uh, I wrote this book called Bleeding Out. And, you know, the council is really one of the nation's leading sort of policymaking advising bodies. It's sort of like the Council on Foreign Relations, but for criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And so there I'm continuing to do a lot of the work that I've been doing and study the issues I've been studying, but with a more concrete focus on actual policy and uh, putting good policies into play, into action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've worked, I mean, I, I know uh, uh, you've worked in, in government before under the Obama administration, and you were also in New York with uh, Governor Cuomo. Um, so I guess, is that, did you go directly from there over to Harvard before this position, or were you working, have, have you been working with other government entities at all, too, in addition to those? Sure. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, I did not sort of, I have not spent my entire career at Harvard. I've spent mm -hmm. most of my career um, you know, in the field as a prosecutor starting out in New York City um, and then in Washington serving President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder um, and then uh, with Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, in New York State. And so I've actually had a lot of policy experience on, on all three levels of government, federal, state, and local. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess... You know, it's, it's interesting coming from a position as a prosecutor um, and now doing the research on this end, you, you must have quite, and I mean, I've, I've read the book. It's great for all of you who uh, do not know. It's called Bleeding Out. Find your local bookstore and get it from there. Uh, but it's, it's it really, it, it obviously informs a lot of the research and the policies that you're looking at. Could you talk a bit about how that experience is really you know, why, why starting out there has led you to, con I mean, continuing to do the work that you're doing today? Sure. So I think that in one way or another, I have been working on issues related to urban gun violence, um, you know, since my early 20s when I started working in criminal justice. And even when I wasn't working in criminal justice, uh, I briefly... Uh, uh, was a teacher during law school at a, uh, at, a, at a public high school in Washington, D.C., where unfortunately one of my students was murdered. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I have been touching this issue uh, as a, you know, as a teacher, as a prosecutor, as a policymaker, um, as a person uh, in, in many ways for a, for a long time. And I think that after uh, my service with the Obama administration and then with Governor Cuomo, I was sort of ready to take a pause and sort of think about what it all meant. And, you know, uh, I had an opportunity to go to Harvard and, and do some of that as a senior fellow there. And so that's where I really started thinking about uh, how can I sort of uh, give voice to some of the lessons that I've learned um, and uh, the, some of the evidence that I've, uh, I've listened to and learned about um, the, the science on it. 
And perhaps most importantly, how can I give voice to some of the people who I've met along the way? Um, many people who are featured in the book are not strangers to me. There are people who I've met through doing this work over, you know, uh, more than 20 years. And so that was, uh, that was a very satisfying sort of part of the book was to give those people um, a voice. People like uh, Kim Odom, who uh, lost her son Stephen Odom to gun violence and uh, others um, uh, who, uh, who were really, you know, impacted firsthand by gun violence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, so often in, you know, any, any kind of professional field, um, you know, I think there's a tendency sometimes to one, ignore the actual human stories behind so much of this. Um, mm -hmm. And two, you know, I, I've seen it, um, you know, you work in different departments or whatever it might be. And, and you work there for a while. And if you're teaching, I mean, you, w since I've been teaching in just this past summer, one of my kids um, in St. Louis was shot and killed in his backyard um, mm -hmm. the day before he was supposed to start second grade. And oh. Yeah, his whole family was there. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of folks came out into the neighborhood and, you know, really were looking for justice in a lot of ways and expected folks to do things for them, especially from a prosecutorial standpoint, uh, from law enforcement. And uh, the system failed. The system failed again because to this day, um, and that happened last summer, to this day, that case hasn't been solved, but multiple people witnessed it. And, you know, it's it's tough. I remember going into the, the neighborhood and there was a lady who was looking at me and uh, she kept kind of following me around. And eventually I went to, to one of the corner store. I, I teach a lot in that neighborhood. And so I went to a corner store, got some water for the grandmother who was there. Um, and when I turned around, there was this lady and she was looking at me in the parking lot. And she uh, she said, are you are you a cop? And I said, because I was wearing a tie. Yeah, I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I, you know, I, I teach here, but, um, I, you know, I work with the aldermen a bit. And she said, well, I need to tell somebody because I saw what happened. And I said, well, do you, have you told the police yet? And she started crying and she said, no. And I said, why not? And she said, because I have kids. Mm -hmm. And it's like those understanding like that story and what that means in terms of the barriers that folks have and, and the lack of resources that we put into protecting folks uh, you know, you don't you don't really get that unless you actually talk to people and understand where they're coming from and what they have to live through. Um, so, I mean, the stories that you include, sir, I, I think you do such a good job in terms of using those to highlight like these actual policy areas and, and, and solutions to a lot of these problems because we have to include those voices in them. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a, a, one of the things that's sort of so compelling about the field of gun violence and trying to save lives through reducing gun violence is it really has this uh, sort of uh, heart uh, and mind balance. You know, it's, it's part art, it's part science. And you can't, uh, you can't approach it purely scientifically, but you also can't approach it purely through emotion. And so I find that to be very interesting. And I do a lot of that. I do a lot of sort of talking very carefully and very soberly about the evidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you have to, you can never forget that this is real people we're talking about, you know, real lives. Um, and, uh, you know, you can never forget those, those stories and those faces uh, because it's, it's just too important. Right, right, right. Um, so, so, okay, so let's, let's get into it. Uh, you, uh, having, you know, had all these experiences and done, you know, implementation and, uh, and research and all these different things and interviewed folks, obviously this is a very, you know, big interest of yours. What you're sitting down with the government. Okay. You're sitting down with somebody who's, who's in charge of a lot of these things. What are the, the most important things for folks to be focusing on at the beginning? Uh, okay. What? What level of government are we talking about? Okay, let's talk. You know what? We're in Missouri. We've got folks from all over Missouri. Talk. Let's talk. Um, let's talk statewide because I know there are a lot of efforts that are going on, especially in Missouri. For those of you who are who are here, uh, we all know that uh, the state legislature uh, has a certain way of doing things, and oftentimes local governments are have their own implementation, often because there's a lack of statewide coordination in so many of these areas. So. Um, 
you know, I, I guess if you're if you're at the statewide level, what are you looking at to do uh, if you've got, for example, our state where we have an issue with violent crime right now? Uh, what what are some of those first steps that you would take? Well, I, so I think there's a bunch of things that uh, you can do um, at the state level in terms of legislation, in terms of creating a good um, sort of statutory framework under which good policy can happen. And unfortunately, I don't think that St. Louis uh, is is moving in the right direction in that way. In fact, I think that uh, you know St. Louis has some of the most permissive gun laws in the in the country. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's a challenge, uh, to operate, um, in that policy environment. So there's things to be done there, but I think that the, one of the sort of most important things is actually recognizing that most of urban gun violence, that's not true of all gun violence, but urban gun violence is happening at the city level. And so one of the things that a governor needs to do is think about how am I supporting my mayors? Hmm. And is there state level funding for evidence-based violence reduction programs to give cities some extra help in what they need? And in fact, uh, that was one of the things that I was proudest of that we did uh, while I was head of public safety under Governor Cuomo, is we set up a statewide program called GIVE, Gun Involved Violence Elimination. And the program uh, offered significant amounts of funding uh, to the cities in, uh, in, in New York State that had the highest rates of gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't just give money with no strings. Uh, it said, if you want to use this funding, you have to use it for the most evidence-based uh, ways to reduce violence. And so we were very particular in how that money could be spent. And so I think that that's, you know, and we've seen now that that strategy that we that we adopted first in New York um, is now being used in California. And I hope that other states will do it um, in terms of setting up sort of uh, these kinds of evidence based funding programs that help cities uh, who are most in need. Right. I mean, because a lot of I mean, obviously, a lot of this stuff is happening in localities dif differently, right? So, so one city might have these, this programming in place that's doing well. I know in, in Missouri, for example, for years, um, Cure Violence, which is one of these big um, you know, community mediation groups that, that's focused on you know, trying to get folks from the community and hiring them to uh, mediate before violence gets out of hand uh, and, and have folks who have experience talking to people within their own neighborhoods. That, that program was active in Kansas City uh, for years. And now, just recently, St. Louis um, funded, uh, put a very big investment into having cure violence in, in St. Louis City. Um, but, you know, we see kind of what happened in Kansas City. They start to lose funding and losing support. So having, you know, kind of looking at what those two different areas, and both of those are, you know, the major metropolitan areas in, in Missouri, uh, but just seeing those two different experiences, it seems like uh, from what you're saying and from, you know, just looking around uh, that what the state needs to do is really appreciate those differences in the localities and in the leadership there and the ways and the challenges really that they're seeing that are different from each other. Well, I, yes and no. And, and here's here's where I would agree. Um, City is very. Um, tremendously, both in the United States and outside the United States, in their capacity. Uh, some cities have uh, very sophisticated uh, data capabilities. Some cities don't. Some cities uh, have set up a office dedicated to reduce urban violence in the mayor's office. Some cities haven't. Um, you know, your, uh, your police uh, uh, forces are better or worse, your education systems, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots and lots of diversity there. But what's interesting is while there's a lot of diversity on the solution side, there's not that much diversity on the problem side, meaning that urban violence looks surprisingly similar place to place to place. And I have been all over this country. Uh, I've been to 15, 20 cities looking at these specific issues. And I've even been all around the world 
the favelas of Rio, um, you know, gang territory in El Salvador. And again and again, in terms of urban violence, it's the same thing. It's young men without a lot of opportunities and without a lot of hope uh, making bad decisions. And, uh, and so, so one of the things that I think you have to sort of break down as a barrier is every city thinks that they have a unique situation. And, and so they think that they need a unique solution. Mm -hmm. Um, but in fact, uh, there's a tremendous amount to be learned from the experience of other cities, because in fact, while your ability to put certain policies into play may vary, your violence is probably going to look similar, if not the same, uh, to other places. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's, that's probably why that statewide coordination would be very helpful. Um, and I'm certain it <laughs> sure sounds like it was. Um, and what kind of, so you, you were talking about this, uh, you know, your, the Give program in New York. What kind of programs would it look to fund? I know you mentioned evidence-based ones, but what, I mean, what, what programs are working? So uh, we funded programs like uh, like Cure Violence, various forms of street outreach programs. You know, uh, Cure Violence is one of many street outreach programs. Uh, we also funded uh, various forms of hotspots and problem solving policing. We also uh, uh, supported a, a, an intervention called Focus Deterrence, which is one of the most uh, effective uh, approaches that we've seen uh, nationwide. But we also did something uh, that uh, perhaps hadn't been done before, which is that we required every city to provide, in order to get this funding, a very concrete plan of how they were going to use that money. And we required that that plan emphasize uh, uh, basically two things, the, the people at the highest risk for being victims of violence or being perpetrators of violence and the places where that violence was most likely to occur. So we said, if you're going to get this money, you have to identify that small number of people mm -hmm. who are most likely to shoot or be shot and those small number of locations, we call them hotspots, where that violence is likely to happen. And your efforts and that funding has to go to those places and those places only. And that is a hard sell um, in many cities. In many cities, people really resist the idea that urban violence is so concentrated and therefore our efforts should be so concentrated. But in fact, in St. Louis, in Kansas City, in LA, in New York, again and again, a surprisingly small number of people are responsible for a surprisingly large share of the violence. You know, in, in uh, you know, uh, you know, it is less than 0.5% of the city's population that is going to be responsible in city after city for 50, 60, 70% of all shootings. And so, you know, not devoting your time and energy and resources to those people and places um, really waters down your effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about that because I think that that is a a criticism, and especially in areas where there's probably a lot of distrust between uh, community members and police, which unfortunately happens far too often in in our country for a lot of reasons. So when we talk about hot spot policing, you know one of the one of the questions that I've 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 heard from especially law enforcement officers actually is well you know if we do hot spot policing won't folks just move to a different spot? Like if we're all focused in this one area, won't people just, well, let's just go somewhere else and, and do the same thing? What, what are, what's your answer to, to that criticism? Right, the answer is, is that we've been studying this problem called crime displacement for mm -hmm. 30 years, and overwhelmingly crime displacement does not happen. And in fact, neighboring areas will benefit when you focus on crime, uh, crime hotspots that are nearby. And the, and the reason is, is because urban violence, the way I describe it, is, is sticky. There's something sticky about these particular people and these particular places. It takes decades of disinvestment in a certain area to create a violence hotspot. That, that is not going to change overnight. And what we see in city after city is the same blocks, 
the same locations, the same housing projects are the most violent areas again and again and again, year after year. So this isn't whack-a-mole. You know, it's not, you know, you, you, you know, you push on the balloon on this side and it just expands on the, on the other side. The other thing is that unlike drug dealing, where there's this strong economic impulse, uh, there's not a replacement effect when you're talking about, uh, about shooters. Hmm. It takes a lifetime of trauma to make someone ready, willing, and able to pick up the gun to shoot people. Um, whereas, and so when you, when you persuade a shooter to change their life or you take them off the street, uh, through incarceration, I, another person, another shooter doesn't step right up. Unlike drug dealing, where as soon as a drug dealer is taken off the street, there's an economic opportunity, which if there's a lot of poor people there, they're going to make use of that opportunity. Mm. And so... It is. It makes a lot of sense to target the highest risk people in places. Yeah. Um, well, on, on the okay, so that's one side. On the other side, you have folks who, um, and you know, in a lot of places, especially in in St. Louis, um, but it's true in Kansas City too. I mean, it's true in so many places. I mean, even in in Carothersville, which is in the boot heel of Missouri, uh, which is the highest concentration of poverty. Uh, is there, I mean, in terms of percent of the population is there, I mean, we've got a ton in, in other more urban areas, but, um, in so many parts of our state and our country, uh, you see poverty, uh, and oftentimes there's a lot of racial segregation that's involved in those areas. So for, for folks who see, you know, there's hotspot policing, you know, I've seen both. I've seen, I've seen sides where, well, is this, is this going to start jailing, uh, imprisoning and cart punishing, folks who are black uh, at a much higher rate now uh, because now we're focused, you know, all of our efforts over here versus, you know, folks who are in the community who, you know, ve very often want want something to happen, right? They want an intervention. They want their kids to be safe. Um, so, I mean, what, you know, I, I, you kind of, I mean, you even talked about it too with, with disinvestment and the need to really deal with a lot of these underlying issues that's leading folks to make these bad decisions. Um, you know, is, is there... Something in this model that can also not just be punitive, but that's also preventive and and can make sure that folks are having that opportunity. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are three fundamental principles of violence reduction. These are the principles that I lay out in the book. The first is the one that we've been talking about, focus, being focused on the highest risk people, places, and behaviors. Um, the second principle, though, is speaking to exactly what you're talking about, which is balance. In terms of interacting with these hot spots and these hot people, there has to be a balance of positive incentives and negative incentives. It can't be all carrot. It can't be all stick. And so, yes, you do have to have the t deterrence of effective law enforcement, but you also need positive alternatives and you need treatment through cognitive behavioral therapy. You need services and support, and you need to meet people where they're at and, and address their immediate needs. But I think that, and so you absolutely do need to give people things to say yes to, as well as things to say no to. But you gotta be careful here. And this is one of the hardest things to understand about urban violence reduction, which is you can't work from the outside in. You can have a balanced approach. But that doesn't mean uh, sending resources to everyone in a poor neighborhood or dealing with broad structural issues like poverty, inequality, structural racism. I'm a political progressive. I believe in addressing all of those things. But that's not the way to make a difference on urban violence. On urban violence, you have to go right at the problem. And you start at the inside and you work your way out. You don't work on the outside and you work your way in. And there's a few reasons for that. The first reason is this highly concentrated nature of urban violence. So if you don't go right at these concentrations, uh, it's a very inefficient way to uh, address the problem and it doesn't, doesn't work. The second issue is that there is not a lot of good evidence, unfortunately, that as rates of poverty change or as rates of inequality change, 
uh, that that's going to have a direct influence on urban violence. There is a correlation versus causation problem. So, for instance, uh, you know, in the in the last recession, uh, right around 2008, 2009, you would have expected to see violence go up during that time because people were poorer. That did not happen. It stayed flat or maybe slightly declined. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at Latin America, many Latin American cities are getting wealthier right now, and there's an expanding middle class, and yet violence is increasing in many, many of these cities. So you can't assume that if you address these big issues that the small issue will uh, happen. And in fact, what my main argument is in Bleeding Out is you've got to reverse this. What you've got to say is instead of saying, if we address all the guns and all the jobs and all the schools and all of the uh, you know, uh, biggest problems, then urban violence will somehow magically take care of itself. Instead, what I suggest is that if you want to transform urban communities and cities generally, start with violence because violence is such a... Uh, it strangles the social and economic vitality of these communities in these cities. Urban violence makes it harder to teach kids. It makes it harder to attract economic and commercial investment. It makes it harder to achieve physical and emotional and mental health outcomes. It makes it, makes it harder to have quality uh, housing. So everything that we wanna do, all the good things that we wanna do in poor communities of color can be disrupted if we don't address urban violence. Now we have to do it in a way that's focused, that's balanced, and that's fair, meaning that those communities actually need to see it as legitimate and believe in it. But I, that is my argument, is that we need to put urban violence first in these communities, not because it's the only issue and not because it's even the most important issue, but because just in terms of sequence, if you don't address that issue first, everything else you'd want to do that's good for these communities is harder. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I think, I think the model is so interesting because oftentimes we think about, you know, addressing whether it's education or, or jobs or all, but I mean, if, if folks don't feel safe, you're going to have a lot of problems doing any of that stuff. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, and, you know, so, so here's, Here's one of the big fo I think I think from the the f focus and balance, and I do want to talk a bit about uh, the focus deterrence model too that you mentioned. Uh, but this 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 concept of fairness seems to be the one that uh, really requires uh, a, a government that 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 figures out a way to get people to buy in. That seems like one of the most important parts of of this fairness model. And it seems like you'd, you'd want to have, tell me if I'm wrong, but you'd want to have a lot of community input um, into at least at least some part of this model to make sure that you're, you're, you're addressing the needs, that you have people who have bought in, that you are able to, I mean, I've, I've always found, and part of this, and folks who are watching now, on this campaign, we've done a lot to uh, make sure that folks have input into the campaign. So all the policy proposals, I mean, even you've contributed to them, uh, but policy proposals that we've put out, everybody can have input into them. And we've got wonderful ideas as a result of that. Um, I would think that that would be something that you would want to do when setting up um, some kind of an anti-violence model, in, whether that's in the city or even statewide. Absolutely. And of course, I, the, the way I describe it is you need to have strategies that are evidence and community informed, mm -hmm. meaning they're informed by the best science available and they're informed by the real lived experiences of people who are actually dealing with both violence and the collateral consequences of violence in terms of over aggressive policing um, and mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, if you do these policies right, you can actually reduce incarceration uh, because you can prevent people from doing the things that they will get incarcerated for. Yeah. Um, but there is a dance, and this is something that uh, makes this work hard, and it makes it uh, sometimes the politics of it a little challenging, which is that in real violence work, nobody gets 100% of they want. 
and nobody gets entirely their way. So if you're a scientist and you just want to be put in charge of this work and you want to say, well, this study does X, Y, Z, and so that's why we should do this, that's not going to happen. Not in, not in real antiviolence work. And if you're someone who's been working in the community and you don't want to talk about the data and you don't want to uh, look at any of the science or hear about the science, that's also not going to work either. And, it, and I really go across the country having difficult conversations with people. I have conversations with people where I'm talking with advocates and I say, look, the hard truth is that you will not sustainably reduce violence uh, without some partnerships with law enforcement. And if you are so uncomfortable with law enforcement that you can't partner with them in any capacity, then you will not be successful. On the other hand, I have equally hard conversations with members of law enforcement where I say, you're not gonna be successful if you don't have partners and friends in the community. And you have to understand that yes, some arrests are necessary, but that you should be arresting and using uh, tough enforcement as a last resort. And so that's you know, one of the reasons that these strategies, even though they're very effective, don't break through because they don't conform to, to the typical talking points uh, of most people. They're not all the way left, and they're not all the way right. And that's one of the hardest things is to say, look, you know, do, if you really want to save lives, if you really care about these people and you really want to keep them safe, you have to be willing to look at this issue in a new way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like you need a balanced approach. So I just <laughs> love the term. I mean, I just, I don't know. Uh, if you... If whoever helped you come up with this or if it just came out of your brain one day, whatever you ate that morning was great because of focus, balance, and fairness, I think it's just – it's such a good way to encapsulate it because then you, you're always coming back, right? You've got three touchstones to always come back to whenever you're trying to implement a strategy. Um, well, that's, that's hopefully you know, something that's useful about the book. And you know, the best thing that I've heard about the book is not that the book has um, – a ton of new insights, um, or that you know I'm some big genius. What I did in that book is I and my colleagues at Harvard went over thousands of anti-violence studies and found the common themes and talked to dozens of people with firsthand experience. And then we organized that knowledge and experience, not what I think, but what they think and what the science says, in an accessible way. So I think the nicest compliment that I hear about the book is, wow, you really, you really put this together well. Not, oh, you're such a genius. Because the book is not really about what I think. It's about what the science says and what people have lived through. Well, I, I'll give you some credit here. I think the ability to synthesize information and communicate does uh, require some, some genius, especially when you do it really well. So. You know, I mean, you can have all the information you want in the world, and uh, there's not much you can do with it unless there's a way to distill it down to make it actionable. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, what's really nice, you're not even mentioning this yet, but you literally have in the back of the book, you have like a whole freaking plan out there. Let's list it out and a whole bunch of this information. So um, it's, it's really, really interesting to have that in there. Uh, what made you, I guess, was... Cause, I mean, it seems like you, you wanted to be a very accessible um, accessible book and something that folks could go to. Um, but what you know, what made you think about, hey, I want to include this specific plan in here as well towards the end? I think it's I think you know, uh, I don't want to I don't want to be you know all Pollyannish or corny or anything like that. But I really wrote this book to save lives. And so I didn't want to write this sort of wonky academic book that criticizes everybody and offers a bunch of insights and then doesn't say what you should actually do. And so I really wrote this book as, an how, as a how-to guide. And the last chapter of the book and the appendix literally walk you through every single step that you should take mm -hmm. and... Um, they offer you a good sense of what it'll cost. And I'm very flattered and very pleased that, in fact, uh, uh, Joe Biden 
in his gun violence uh, overall platform, has endorsed the 899 million national gun violence plan that's in the book. And so, uh, you know, I am supporting, uh, uh, um, you know, Joe Biden for a variety of reasons. But I'm particularly excited by the prospect that if he is elected, um, we could see real resources going to this issue and going to them in a way that won't be wasted. Mm. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Man, that's got to be nice to get a presidential candidate to be like, hey, I like what this guy wrote, so <laughs> let me get that going. I think that's pretty, uh, that's pretty great. Have you, um, I guess in the same vein, have you had, do you know, folks who are, I mean, you know, a lot of folks who work in the Department of Justice, um, you know, oftentimes they stay to, you know, different administrations. Um, you know, I've got a bunch of friends who are at the Attorney General's office here in Missouri who have been there, you know, no matter who the Attorney General is or at the, you know, DOJ locally. Um, I mean, do you think that any there is any appetite even within the current administration for implementing any of these kinds of plans? Is there anything that is ongoing right now at the federal level? Um, you know, there are some efforts, and uh, my colleagues at the Justice Department are uh, are you know trying to uh, support cities in their fight on urban violence. But I just have to say, uh, and I hope I'm not, you know, if I'm accused of being partisan, then so be it. You can do whatever but, you want. This is your, your time on this show. You do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, I just, I just have to be honest about this, sure, which is sure. that um, this administration really only sees um, one side of the solution. And so this, this administration is very supportive of, uh, of tough and aggressive law enforcement. And there is a time and a place for that. But in my time during the Obama administration, we supported law enforcement, but we also supported community-based programs. We were also working to reverse mass incarceration. We were also trying to address the school-to-prison uh, pipeline. And so, you know, I am not a abolitionist. I don't believe that uh, we don't need prisons or we don't need cops or we don't need prosecutors. We absolutely do. But we need a balanced solution. We need social services. We need treat, uh, you know, effective treatment and all of, all of these other things. And unfortunately, um, this administration seems to only emphasize the law enforcement side. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, a, that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a couple comments here I'm going to throw on the screen. We've got Audrey. Audrey's great. Uh, permissive gun laws are a problem, true. So we do, do have some of those issues here in Missouri. There were some recent efforts even during the pandemic. Uh, we talked about this before we went on uh, in our state legislature to try to get a whole bunch of laws passed that, uh, you know, were not really, didn't seem emergency in nature. Um, and uh, none of those really made it across the finish line. Uh, we got another comment from Lavelle. I'm going to put on here if I can drag it on. Okay, hold up. Look, I'm getting fancy with this thing, but this way we can get people's comments in here. So Lavelle's got, no, partnership with law enforcement isn't the point of focus. Honestly, it's education, lack of sophistication through education that brings and breeds violence. Oh, it just popped off. Hold up. We can come back. But yeah, I think, I think his, so he says at the end, ultimately the psychological temperance of a society. I think, you know, there's a lot of folks who look at, um, you know, look at the issue of violence or look at these big issues. And they are really big, right? They've been there for a while. They're overwhelming oftentimes. We've heard folks come in and they peddle a program and maybe they stick around, maybe they don't. And, you know, we start to look at it as, well, yeah, society has a problem. And obviously we've got many, got many problems. But, you know, I, I think there's, there's this, oftentimes this, this overwhelming feeling of like there's something like rotten to the core uh, but you're really proposing like, well, look, we've got we've got the ability to deal with this problem. We just have to do it in a very systematic way. Yeah. And I, I just have to say, you know, this, uh, you know, I, I appreciate Lavelle's perspective, uh, but he's wrong. And, you know, this is a very common misunderstanding of of urban violence, which is that if you just deal with the root causes, one of which is lack of education, and one of which is sort of, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, uh, um, the sort of norms and conventions around around violence that, you know, if you think big, that you will suddenly sort of magically solve this thing. 
And the answer is, is that, you know, as a matter of politics and budgets, there's no realistic way to magically transform education spending or economic spending or housing spending in any of these of these ways to sort of, you know, overnight have a big impact. And the, and, the, and the evidence, the research says, is that you can change those causes, but urban violence will remain if you don't address it directly. Mm-hmm. And so I just have to keep repeating this. And, you know, I am a political progressive. I believe in education. I believe in housing and all of, all of these things. So I'm not arguing against those things. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, you know, we have, to, we have to be honest about, you know, the fact that those things are not necessarily going to address uh, urban violence in the short term or even the middle term. Mm-hmm. And so you need a set of strategies that, to focus directly on violence. It is, it is really in some ways as simple as to address violence, focus on violence. Mm-hmm. Well, then you get somebody like me, right, who's – and we've had similar experiences where we uh, uh, have both – you know, worked in education, have seen this up close, right? And we're just sitting there and, you know, okay, so you get, let's say, let's say, okay, we win this election, you know, I'm calling you up. You're going to be my first, my second call. I'll call my mom first and I'm going to call you. And then, and then say, hey, look, um, uh, here's what we want to do, but you know me now and you've heard my stories and the experience that I've gone through and, oh man, like I, you know, I'm with Lavelle here and I just, I really want to, to deal with this on so many different issues, right? I, I want to go and hear, and, and when I hear you talk about, Housing, which is a big issue, um, it's something that the attorney general's office deals with, or should be dealing with, I should say, in Missouri. Um, we've got education, which the attorney general touches on too. Governor does as well. The legislature does. I mean, is there is there any room for um, someone who is in that you know a statewide position, or even at the federal level, um, who you know you can look at these these different areas? And say, look, we, we do have a big problem in education and, and healthcare and all these different things. Is there a way to coordinate those efforts to work better with an anti-violence model? Or am I just am I just is, I'm just letting my heart lead and I should, you know, I should really be talking about violence first um, before I even get to that point. Uh, yeah, the 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 hard but real answer right. is yeah, yeah. no, you should not create a massive comprehensive er- er- uh, effort that deals with education and housing and this and that and the other thing. And that, you know, at some, some point we'll deal with violence. That we've tried that, it's been evaluated many, many times. It has not worked. But here's what you can do. You can use your bully pulpit and, and especially as a prosecutor, um, make a very compelling argument that for these very small groups of people and places, we need to pair, uh, you know, focused, you know, deterrence and law enforcement with real alternatives to violence. Mm-hmm. But the but the difference is is don't make this about everybody. Make this about the small numbers of young men, and it is overwhelmingly men in these in these jurisdictions, and say, look. In St. Louis, I don't have to help, you know, 50,000 people or 100,000 people. I need to help 300 people who are at the highest risk for shooting and being shot. And if I really work with these 300 people, giving them alternatives, uh, you know, giving them intensive cognitive behavioral therapy, offering them um, subsidized employment, Um, you know, getting them transitional housing, all of these things, uh, combined with real sanctions, if they continue to persist in violence, you will see the numbers drop. And that will help all of the poor people in in St. Louis. And so what I'm saying is, is ultimately, no one should be satisfied in St. Louis, in any other city in Missouri or across the nation, with neighborhoods that are poor, unequal but safe or but nonviolent. Nobody should want that. All I'm saying is you have to tackle the violence first to get to your broader social justice outcomes. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up again because it is such a small number of folks who are perpetuating or perpetrating and also perpetuating this the, the violence that is occurring. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a few times and I, I almost forgot to come back to it. Could you tell us what focused deterrence is? 
Right. So focus deterrence is a strategy that creates a, a partnership between law enforcement, service providers, and community members. And this partnership then identifies the people and places, the people who are at the highest risk for gun violence, the shooters, those who are most likely to, most likely to shoot or be shot, and then confronts them, talks to them, and says, look, uh, if you let us, we're here to help you, and if you make us, we're here to stop you. And uh, in this conversation, they say, here are all the services that we can offer you. Here's all the things that we can do to, you know, uh, to make your life easier. If you stop, uh, if you stop shooting, stop killing. You, you, you often introduce them to members of the community who say, we love you, we need you, but the violence must stop. And then you, and then you talk to them candidly about all the sanctions and say, look, if you continue to persist in violence, we will come after you and we will, you will be incarcerated. And it is that balance of carrot and stick that really starts changing it. and hearing that it's not just the police saying it, it's the service providers, it's the moms who have lost sons and everybody's saying, look, you have a choice here. You know, it doesn't have to be this way. And if you make the right choice, we are here to support you. But if you make the wrong choice, we have to do what we have to do because we have to keep people safe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Audrey had uh, a few other questions that I think that we can put together. Uh, her big ones are, you know, it's about community organizations. So churches, for example, nonprofit organizations uh, approaching this from, you know, the, the side, I guess, almost like a non-governmental side, but also uh, from families and, and having you know, folks within that community being a part of this. Um, and then finally, uh, this is, I mean, this is, this is the, the question. Does this take a generation? Uh, right. St. Louis has a very short vision of working with these issues. Um, and I think that's oftentimes very true because you've got elected officials who are trying to get reelected or whatever might be. Um, sure. what, what is the timeline on these kinds of things? Right. So uh, let me take the, the first is issue, the, the last question first. Right. So, uh, no, you can make an immediate difference on these issues. You can start reducing violence essentially today. Now, what I, what I mean by today is most of these initiatives take about six months or a year to plan and get on the ground. So, you, so no, you can't sort of, you know, start next weekend. But after that six months to a year, you can, uh, you can expect to see violence start to decline right away. And I think a conservative estimate, as I put it in my book, is about 10% a year every year. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but over eight years, two mayoral or presidential terms, that ends up being more than 50% reduction in homicide. So you can turn a city around in eight years if you keep your eye on focused on the prize, if you stay focused, balanced, and fair. And to Audrey's question, um, absolutely, uh, faith-based leaders and organizations play a role. And you know, bringing in um, community members and family members plays a role. But I think the issue is, it always is about partnerships. It's not about just the community, and it's not about just the government. It's about them working together. And that is what's hard, is people want to work on these things, but they want to do so in their silos. Mm -hmm. They want to say, oh, well, you know, I'm happy to, uh, to, to get involved, but I want to do things the way I've always do things. And I don't want to work with people who maybe I'm not used to working with. But that is not the way this works. I, when I have seen this work, I have literally seen former gang members sit down with gang officers who five years before, they were chasing each other around in the community and they hated each other. <laughs> and now they're working together on urban violence, urban violence issues. Yeah. And so if you're not willing to sit down with someone who maybe at the outset, you don't trust or you don't like um, and try to get to know them and try to work with them, this work is really hard. Yeah. And but, but I have found that enormously rewarding. Look, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, I come from a upper middle class background, you know, in Cambridge. 
And I have met over 20 or 30 years so many people who are so extraordinarily different from me, you would think, by the way they grew up or what they've been through or these things. And now some of these people are some of my closest friends. Come over to my, you know, I know their family members, they know mine. Um, and that is something that is incredibly rewarding. And I think, you know, many people in, in, you know, who are watching this who have been involved in these things, like the relationships that you build with people who seem different than you at first, but are actually, you know, have all the same concerns, uh, as, as you do, because at the end of the day, we really are more alike than different. Mm -hmm. Um, it's incredibly rewarding. Yeah. Ain't that. That's like lesson for everything. This is uh, so important that you know, the more we become familiar with each other and understand each other, um, the more stuff we can get done. And uh, there's a lot of groups just like this who are, who are doing great work in Missouri. We're hoping to bring them on on some other shows. This is only the first in a series about uh, this issue, which is a very important one and one that I think we can get a lot done um, You know, in a lot of the ways that Thomas is talking about. So uh, I appreciate you sharing all of this with us. Um, We've got to play our game. Are you ready? Absolutely. Okay, we're going to do this. Now, folks who have watched the pod before, you know uh, that every once in a while we get to have a game out. We do it in the last few minutes here. Uh, so this one is, uh, you know how you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover? Well, mm -hmm. we're going to judge a book by its cover. In fact, three of them. Uh, so the game is, this is a book. This will be our first one. And this is Thomas's job to guess uh, whether this is a work of uh, fiction or nonfiction. That's it. If you can get the actual book, you get bonus points for that. Uh, we, I don't think we've had anybody who's been able to do that quite yet. This one is, uh, it's been certainly been used quite a bit uh, by me. And uh, it's out there. So if you're watching right now, go ahead and give it a guess. Take your time. You have any thoughts yet? You have any questions about what you're seeing? I think we got a pretty good view up there. To me, it looks like some type of book about incarceration. Mm. So I would go with nonfiction. Okay, you go with nonfiction. Is that your final answer? That's my uh, uh, unsure yet <laughs> final answer. <laughs> well, this is going to be a very difficult one. I just want you to know I pulled out all the stops on this one. This is actually the complete short stories of our friend Mr. Kafka. So uh, <laughs> you are, you are <laughs> a prison of the mind, I think. <laughs> wow, way off. Yeah, that's good. Well, this one's going to be well, even tougher. Well played, Elad. All right, this one's going to be really tough. So uh, here's the book. Everything is obscured. So what you know is that it is an entirely white cover other than the title. And I'll even give you this, the name of the author. Look, I'm helping you out here today. So if anybody, if you're at home, you're playing along, guess now. Go ahead. All right, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with fiction. You're going with fiction. Okay, final answer. Final answer. Okay, you're feeling it. Fiction. All right. Well, the answer is is nonfiction. It's actually uh, Professor Tribe's Constitutional Choices. It's a, a seminal book in constitutional law, but a very tough one to get. All right, look, we got one more. I'm, I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty. Look, you're getting this podcast with a whimper here. I mean, I am not looking good here. I have I have a good feeling about this one. This one, I think you're gonna get. This is our last one, third book mm -hmm. right here. See if you can get this one. I am gonna guess that that is a uh, incredibly powerful, well written, um, and uh, extremely necessary book for everyone on this podcast to read. Nonfiction. Yes. Nonfiction. In fact, it is bleeding out by our one and only Thomas App. So, yes. See, I told you you were going to get one of these. It's a tough game. There we this go. This is a great book. It's got important information for it for all of you and anybody. I mean, if you're working in government, uh, this was actually referred to me by a former prosecutor friend of mine. And he said, I must read this immediately. I certainly did. So, thank you, buddy. Uh, you're watching out there. Uh, so, thank you so much for coming. I, I really appreciate you. Not, not, only you know the time that you've taken but all the time that you're taking to really deal with this issue um, and answer folks questions and be really transparent about everything that you're doing so um, i think that's really important i think it's a way that we can really make sure that government is working for us and to have such great ideas uh presented here for folks in missouri um thank you so much for doing that and taking the time to be here with us hey it's my pleasure i'm happy to be here wonderful well folks uh thanks for coming
Uh, I'll plug in a couple of things right here at the end. But uh, we really appreciate you. So next week, we actually already have our next Alad Pod booked. We'll put the graphic out pretty soon. It will be Senator Brian Williams uh, over here in the, uh, the St. Louis area. He's a state senator for Missouri. Wonderful guy. We're going to talk a lot about um, this issue, actually, quite a bit here in Missouri um, and things we should look for in our legislature and ways that we can get involved to really make sure our government is working. So we're really excited for that. So make sure to tune in. It will be next week again live Saturday at 1 o'clock. Excited to have him. We've got some other guests that are coming up too. So make sure to keep tuning in. Uh, Today we do have another text party that will be at 3 o'clock. So from 3 to 5, the system is way better. All of our volunteers will tell you if you volunteer with us, make sure to comment, let people know. But you can go ahead and register now if you haven't already. Uh, We do a Zoom call. I'm there. You get questions as you're texting people in Missouri. I'm right there to help you do it. So please go ahead and come to that. And as always, you can find us and all these shows and just about anything else that you need to get involved in Missouri at alodgross.org.